Hi there, welcome to the Non Servian Podcast. I'm Lucy Steigerwald, and I'm here with Eric Dreitzer. Eric is an independent political analyst and host of Counterpunch Radio. You can find his exclusive content, including articles, podcasts, audio commentaries, poetry, and more at patreon.com slash Eric Dreitzer. And you can follow him on Twitter, which I definitely can vouch for is a good is a good time at uh, Stop Imperialism, all one word. Eric, um, thanks for coming on the podcast today. Absolutely, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. I uh, said your name right, right? Yep, you got it. I was convinced and convinced for a minute that it was Dreitzer. I was dead convinced. I have lived many years with those debates that people have, and the many ways that it's been pronounced in my life. So you did great. <laughs> Um, all right, let's kind of dive in. Well, let's start with you, I guess. Um, I want to ask how you got into radical politics, but also how would you describe the politics you have? Um, I guess a long journey. I will, I will, uh, put it into as small of a nutshell as I can. Um, I come from a, uh, family of Soviet immigrants, you know, immigrated from the Soviet Union in the late 1970s. Uh, the politics of my home was uh, pretty right wing reactionary pro Zionist type of politics, which is fairly standard for the uh, Soviet emigre Jewish community of that period. Um, so my, political understanding as a you know high school kid um, leading up to 9/11 which happened when I was in the 12th grade was um, you know sort of um, Israel is good everybody who hates Israel is bad um, you know not socially conservative politics but neocon Reaganism more or less um, which again is fairly standard for much of that community uh, my that my parents generation and so forth um, so anyway from there um, I went to college and uh, as I said 12th grade was 911 so the next year was the beginning of the Iraq war and the Iraq or is what really began my activism. It's what it's what motivated me to obviously begin to think outside of the box that my parents had established for me, politically speaking. And um, that led to a kind of winding path through a lot of different uh, nooks and crannies of the left um, and uh, anarchism and socialism and Marx and uh, mm-hmm. right wing anarchism, anarcho capitalism <laughs> that interested me for about three seconds. Um, <laughs> you know, until I actually read a little bit about it, um, you know, and, and all kinds of different things. Anarcho syndicalism of Rudolf Rocker was very exciting for me when I discovered that. Um, and, you know, a lot of that was really uh, me exploring many different things. And I will say a watershed moment for me was uh, reading Marx. Um, reading Marx was very taboo. Obviously, Marx, Lenin, Engels, all of that sort of stuff was very off limits in, in you know, on an intellectual level from, you know, where my parents, you know, come from. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, reading Lenin, uh, uh, imperialism and understanding things at a more theoretical level in my twenties was, was particularly useful. Um, And that, of course, that led us through, I guess, you know, the Bush era and so forth. And then that brought us into the Obama years and uh, leading into Occupy. I was involved with Occupy from the beginning in Zuccotti Park. In New York City. Um, And at the time, I was still a teacher. So I was also involved in the UFT, uh, union organizing. Union organizing might be a bit grandiose, but I was a member of UFT and a delegate at the delegate assembly and so forth. And anyway, all of these things sort of came together around the same time in 2011, the time of the war on Libya as well, Mm -hmm. which I was very active on. And uh, that drove me to uh, start my first podcast, which was, God, 11 years ago now. And and my first website and that you know from there it's just kind of evolved and i've been on the left for a long time despite the fact that i kind of dabbled in a lot of different things but um yeah so i mean i guess that's it <laughs> i mean i'm gonna make you do like a one to five word summary though like where are you now under politics like what do you i don't know it's very hard to say because you know i would say that um you know I would say that I'm a communist, except I don't belong to any communist parties. I don't like any communist parties, and I don't like a lot of the communists I come across. Um, I'm not an anarchist anymore, although I no. once identified as I, I once identified that way. Um, I have a lot of anarchist friends. I have a lot of Marxist friends. I I kind of try to think of myself as somewhat. Um, 
broadly speaking, a socialist. I, I, I guess anarcho-communism comes pretty close to uh, some of the ideas that I that I like, but the term anarcho-communism also carries with it certain historical baggage that I don't necessarily totally agree with either. So I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know that there is a particular term. I mean, generally, I like socialist and Marxist. I mean, I, I also like anti-imperialist. I mean, I use the tools of Marxism. Um, I use the tools of analysis that have been provided over generations before. And um, I try to come to my own conclusions. But um, I don't know. I have a lot of anarcho friends. I have a lot of commie friends. And uh, I disagree with both groups often. So, um, I, I guess I don't want to go too far down this lane, but I'm always intrigued because I haven't read any Marx directly. I always find that rather daunting, but what did, and it being taboo is, is quite interesting and makes sense given the context. Um, what did you get out of Marx and particularly Lenin, who to me is instantly more controversial for obvious reasons? Well, Lenin specifically was uh, imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. Mm -hmm. that, that work, which was the first for me that really helped me to understand that imperialism was something more than a nebulous concept, that it was rooted in some material forces that we had to understand global finance. You had to understand finance capital, how that worked, how it sought out markets, the nature of the relations between imperial, uh, uh, you know, imperial centers and their colonies and so forth. So that sort of the dynamic analysis that Lenin provided of imperialism, which is not, of course, it's not 100% translatable to today because things mm -hmm. are different now but the, the 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 rudimentary analysis the basics of it the fundamentals um was really enlightening for me um and marx um it, it was the tools it was under once i began to understand the nature of what historical materialism means that we get that the world is knowable that history is understandable if we understand it as the product of contending classes if we understand it as the product of these conflicts and that we and that if we can if that if the if the past is knowable and the world is knowable and we have the tools to provide that to, to analyze the world, then we can shape it into something better. Right. That's the essence of Marxism is allowing you the tools to be able to build something better than what currently exists. Anarchism, in my experience, has a lot of that same drive. It just mm -hmm. there are historical reasons that we don't have time to go into the first international and Bakunin <laughs> versus Marx and all of those things, why those traditions separated, how they kind of diverged, where the differences in them are. I mean, I've read Malatesta, I've read a lot of anarchist stuff, but Marx, at least for me personally, Marx unlocked a lot of understanding of the world for me. And that was, um, like I said, it was sort of a watershed for me in my own uh, political development. Mm. Yeah, yeah, all the name drop, and I know there's names, but I, I know you've read a lot more stuff directly than I oh, have. I, I'm oh. not in any way saying that to like name drop. I merely say that because I'm not somebody who has no understanding of the anarchist tradition sure, and, yeah. the, and the Marxist tradition. I've, 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 I've read through both, and I do have some grounding in it, even if I've moved away from my early 20s, uh, where I very strongly identified as an anarchist and, and into my 30s and late 30s now where I I don't, I, I identify much more as a, as a Marxist. Did you see Occupy as a particularly anarchist movement? And did that, uh, did that turn you off at all? Direct action some, stuff? So, 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 not the not so much the direct action i i didn't have any problem with direct action so much i i i had a bigger issue with the um what I perceive to be the inability, the inability to make uh, uh, collective decisions by majority and sure. instead focusing on consensus and the consensus versus majority, which I think was one of the biggest, if not the biggest stumbling blocks for Occupy, that made it very difficult to move forward with a lot of action. So, um, no, I, I mean, Occupy was great. I loved Occupy. I, I have so many great things to say about it, especially since Occupy in its broadest legacy form really really uh, uh, more than anything else in the last 15 years really has driven much of our political development is on the left. I mean, if you look at a lot of the movements on the left that exist today, they are in various ways connected to Occupy, whether directly or indirectly as like offshoots, uh, including 
fight for minimum wage, including uh, prison abolitionism and many other issues that are front and center in our politics now that 11 years ago when we were hanging out in Zuccotti Park, it was a big deal. We were talking about all of those things. So um, it's been tremendously influential. There would have been no Bernie Sanders without Occupy. There would have been none of this development of what we now call the, the, the online left and all of that. I mean, I don't want to say it wouldn't have happened, but it wouldn't have happened in the way that it did. Occupy was extremely influential. I'm proud to have been a part of it, even if it didn't accomplish nearly as much as I thought it could have at the time. Um, but, you know, Many people can give many reasons for why that happened. Yeah, I mean, I remember some serious ambition, um, maybe too much. I sat through a single meeting of Occupy DC um, and the attempt at, at consensus, it did seem to last just forever and ever. And I was like, I like the ideals here, but uh, we will be here for the rest of our lives. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you couldn't come up with a way to order lunch, you know what I mean? You're not <laughs> going to come up with a hard and fast approach to imperialism and capitalism and, you know, the, the issues of our day. So, yeah, that was that was frustrating. But, you know, I mean, here we are like 11 years later, 10 and a half years later, whatever. And I mean, I, I have I tend to dwell on the positive memories rather than those things that piss me off. That's fair. Um, you touched on, I mean, actually kind of, everything you, you summed up in your politics kind of dipped into foreign policy stuff. But I guess, when did you start focusing on that in your career? And um, well, independent political analyst is actually an interesting self-described. Uh, it's a term I made up that apparently a <laughs> lot of people now seem to use that. And I'm like, that's, that's cool with me. I mean, that's fine. I didn't make up any of those words. I just put them together and made up a title. <laughs> um well, I uh, between between you and me and your listeners and viewers, I mean, I do have a nine to five job. This is not mm -hmm. this does not pay my mortgage. This does not pay for our health insurance and all of that stuff. Unfortunately, you have to be a really successful uh, propagandist for somebody to get that kind of level of pay. Uh, if you're really doing it independently and you're really doing it like authentically and speaking without any other agendas, then chances are you're going to have to find another way to support your family. So um, I have a regular job, but this is what I do on the side. And I'm, I'm fortunate in the sense that my job does have enough flexibility to where I have the time to be able to put together videos and podcasts and these other things like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that, um, independent, independent media is a very interesting word these days because I see advertisements for the New York times saying support independent journalism. And it's like, well, if that, I mean, if words don't mean anything, then whatever, but like, that's not independent media. So. I guess they're not directly owned by a hedge fund or <laughs> by Jeff Bezos, I guess, they're trying I, to pull that. A f incredibly I, wealthy family is independent. I, 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 yes, I don't know exactly what that's supposed to mean. But a lot of people nowadays are, are calling themselves independent. A lot of Russian propagandists like to be on YouTube calling themselves independent journalists. That's not independent surprising. Political analysts. A lot of people who are just, you know, generally uh, uh, very much kind of... Um, superficial in their politics, but uh, use this to make money, use this for clicks, use it for, you know, I don't know, whatever people do on Twitch and these other platforms, you know, I, I mean, I guess it's, I guess it's a business now. Um, how, and how did you get into um, working with Counterpunch? Uh, well, I was doing my podcast and had my website back. So, I mean, Back in those days, I was still I was still well I was still welcomed on RT. I was still welcomed sure. on other platforms. Uh, this was in the Obama years, the the you know in the middle of the Obama years. Um, I remember, you know, and uh, RT specifically did uh, actually, to their credit, was excellent on the Libya war. And it was it was several years later that they made their turn towards real fascist, hard fascist mm -hmm. politics, and that was where I had my falling out with them, and that was when I got blacklisted by all Russian media. Media was in 2015 over the refugee if you remember the refugee crisis in Europe the mi so-called migrant crisis uh, and RT and the Russians went hard right in their coverage on that deeply xenophobic anti-immigrant stuff I basically said listen this is some fucking fascist stuff here folks I'm out I'm not I'm done with this you know and then of course within a few months that led to Brexit which then led to Trump and you know, I don't have to explain how all things evolve from there. But um, back in those days, I was I was still getting my face on TV, sort of. And um, uh, 
I started, I was also submitting written articles to Counterpunch. And I, when I went back to uh, Southern California, which is where I'm from originally, I hung out with uh, Josh as the managing editor of Counterpunch. We became close friends and that's that. Um, and we, I remember having a conversation with him at the bar and I said, listen, you, you, Counterpunch needs podcasts, man. I mean, everybody's doing podcasts now. And he was like, I know. And, I, and he was like, you should do it. And that's how it happened. Uh, what do you, what do you like about Counterpunch, um, you know, politically, et cetera? Um, well, Counterpunch has evolved a lot. You know, I remember when I first came along, came, came across Counterpunch, it used to publish a lot of different, a lot of different types of voices. Um, things have changed. Politics has changed. And I'm really proud that we've been able to change along with them. Um, a lot of people who uh, have, who used to appear on Counterpunch no longer do for reasons that I'm not going to go into now, but uh, needless to say uh, that Counterpunch has been steadfast. I believe um, when a lot of uh, other publications have not been um, steadfast in an anti-war in a pro environment in a pro indigenous peoples in a, uh, uh, um, I mean, you could think of any number, anti-nuclear, um, all of the key issues that really animate the, the, the real politics of the left. I think Counterpunch has been consistent on, despite uh, differences of opinion that I've had with some of the people that they've had contributing there uh, at various times. And um, generally speaking, I put a tremendous amount of value in publications that strive to be original, that strive to be truly independent and to provide a variety of perspectives. It's what Counterpunch does. Um, there's every day I go to Counterpunch and I see stuff that I'm like, fuck that guy. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I it's like, I don't agree with that, you know, but Counterpunch is cool because it does provide a, a certain kind of platform that allows for these competing voices. And, you know, I'm also fortunate that I'm involved with it at a sort of intimate level. And my voices tends to be one of the ones that's published there a lot. So, you know, it's like people don't like it. Hey, there's other people on Counterpunch you can read. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we should get into more Russia stuff. Um, actually, first, I kind of want to ask you about 2014. When, sure. when you started paying attention to modern Russian politics and, and you know, Putin and 2014 and the uh, annexations and like, what did you think about that at the time? Well, I was I was much more pro Russian at the time. I, I as my family comes from Ukraine, and, um, no. and so in 2014, I was very much uh, concerned that we were seeing a far right. Uh, sort of uh, putsch in Ukraine, one that was certainly amplified by Russian media. I was one of the people on Russian media saying those things, you know, and I was concerned about those things. And, um, and they were real to an extent, but like a lot of Russian propaganda, there was there was truth that was kind of wrapped up in a in a ball of bullshit, you know, and it took me several years to sort of unravel a lot of that and to unlearn some of the things that I thought I understood um, and uh, to come to a more I guess you could say a more nuanced position. And one of those, one of those things was speaking to Ukrainians, Ukrainian leftists and others who I came in contact with after 2014. But anyway, to your point, to your question, uh, my thoughts in 2014 were basically more or less aligned with uh, the uh, pro-Russian view that it was the European Union and the United States and NATO that were driving a conflict and pulling, trying to pull Ukraine out of Russia's orbit, sphere of influence and into the European one. And at some level, that's very, uh, that's, there's a level of truth to that. Obviously, Kissinger and others have spoken to that recently and made headlines over, you know, uh, issues of NATO expansion and so forth. So I had very much that line. Um, now, obviously, moving forward in the timeline, a lot of things became more clear to me after 2016, the uh, the emergence of Trump, the uh, unraveling exactly how that happened, why that happened, what role the Russians played, how Russian propaganda figured into all of these things. So there were a lot of uh, moments that I had to kind of go through in my own personal experience for me to learn, I guess, at a, at a fun, at a deeper level, what was really happening there. So, uh, in essence, um, I was pretty, I was pretty, um, supportive of the Russian line up until about 2015 or so 2015, 2016. And then by 2016, I mean, I was fully out of that and really, uh, um, well, like I said, I got blacklisted by all Russian media because I openly condemned all of them on the air so you know that was that 
that would do it. Um, do you think that you have shifted since then, but also sort of what has shifted in terms of there being an organic feeling in Ukraine, like if, if that makes sense. I mean, Ukraine is totally different. Yep. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I did not mean to cut you off. <laughs> Just, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've heard it said that sort of there was, you know, coup-like activity. There was U.S. messing in Ukraine. Um, but obviously today, you know, there's an, there, it's different. And, and, and there are obviously leftists and other anti-authoritarian people in Ukraine with actual feelings. Um, I guess, I guess what has changed over there? Not just you, but what has changed over there since then? Well, I would say first and foremost, I cannot and would not speak for Ukrainians. I mm-hmm. think Ukrainians can certainly speak for themselves. I'm not in Ukraine. I, can, I am not reporting from the ground there. And I'm not even in touch with all that many people in Ukraine at the moment. So I, I just I only say that because I don't want it to sound like I'm speaking for them mm-hmm. or that I even have the ability or knowledge to speak on their behalf. But uh, my uh, sort of very distant outsider's perspective of what shifted is uh, quite a lot, actually. Um, One of the things that has changed, uh, and I'm talking about before Russia's invasion, because Russia's mm-hmm. invasion united the country, galvanized support behind a pre- behind the president and so forth. So that's a slightly different dynamic. But in that interim period, um, the war in the East, in Donbass, became, you know, the central question. And um, I'm, I'm, of course, greatly reducing a lot of uh, important history that's happened in the last few years. But the bottom line is that uh, the president that came into power, Poroshenko, who is himself an oligarch, a billionaire with a, a confectionery empire, literally chocolate producing uh, companies, um, he became he became president. And rather than seek peace, he sought to more or less eject the Russian proxies from Donbass and, and and launched several offensives to do so. That, of course, led to um, what we understood to be the frozen conflict, the ongoing sort of simmering tensions in Donbass for several years. That leads us to 2019, which is the election between Poroshenko going for re-election and this actor named Zelensky, this mm-hmm. outsider politician named Zelensky. But this is the narrative, I think, that uh, you, know, you could get from the Washington Post and the New York Times. If you want the kind of analysis that I do, I'm looking for what are the material forces behind them and the material forces leading up to Zelensky's rise were two, uh, uh, several, but really a couple of primary oligarchs that backed him. And the one most obvious and most important was Kolomoisky, Igor Kolomoisky, one of the probably the most powerful person in Ukraine or certainly one of the most powerful people in Ukraine. He had been the he had been the. Um, owner of private bank in Ukraine, which was basically this massive private bank that he controlled that more or less functioned as the central bank of Ukraine, but in his private control. And so Kolomoisky uh, backs Zelensky. Zelensky rises to power, but Zelensky moves away from Kolomoisky for a variety of reasons that we also don't have time to go into. And he proves himself to be a pretty deft political operator who kind of walks the line between several different oligarchs. And at Mm -hmm. the same time, Zelensky was courting the IMF, trying to get the IMF to give an $8 billion loan to Ukraine to get Ukraine out of an economic disaster that it has been in literally since the end of the US, uh, the USSR. Mm -hmm. Um, And Part of the conditions for that was that Zelensky moves away from Kolomoisky. So they take the bank away from Kolomoisky. They even passed a law nationalizing the bank that he had been controlling. The idea, uh, excuse me, this happened under Poroshenko. Zelensky comes to power. Some believe he's just going to put the bank right back in Kolomoisky's hands, but he doesn't. Instead, he kind of threads the needle between these different oligarch factions. The reason I bring all of this up is because Zelensky is not just some media creation. He is a political operator who has very real material forces that he has to navigate. And if we can understand how he navigates those forces, we can understand something about modern today's contemporary Ukraine. There's a reason why Zelensky was so extremely popular in that election, why he won almost across the board everywhere with the exception of the far west, which is the most hard right wing 
part of Ukraine. He sure. won in the east. He won in the center of the country. He won in Kiev. He won in Odessa. He won in the Russian speaking areas. He won in Ukrainian speaking areas. He won among Jews. He won among non-Jews. In other words, Zelensky was was an extremely uh, uh, powerful political opponent that rose to this position through a variety of circumstances. And um, what did he represent? He represented, at least at the time, he represented a desire for peace. Mm -hmm. that, that's the most important point to understand. Zelensky ran on a platform of making peace with the Russians and ending the disaster in the East, right? But that is a platform you can run on that doesn't necessarily mean that's what's going to happen. Sure. And so what ultimately happened was Zelensky, for various reasons, didn't make peace with the Russians. Now, depending on who you ask, it's because Zelensky wasn't really serious about doing that or because the Russians weren't really serious about dealing with Zelensky in an honest way. I think it's probably a bit of both, uh, maybe more the latter than the former, but either way. Um, and so eventually it seems that Putin calculated that here's this guy and we thought we could deal with them we thought we could implement the minsk agreements which by the way the russians drafted according to their own desires and their own sort of interests and uh it didn't work out that way and so the russians obviously made the calculation to invade the country and i think that the minute that that happened ukraine united those divisions that existed before divisions between the oligarchs divisions between west and east divisions between russian speakers and non-russian or i guess they're all Russian speakers, but Russian speakers pro exclusively and Ukrainian mm -hmm. speakers. Um, a lot of these divisions kind of melted away and, and the invader became the invader and uh, Ukrainians became Ukrainians. And I think that um, those that divisions still exist and competing interests still exist. And, you know, Dmitry Fertash and Igor Kolomoisky and, uh, you know, all of these different um, oligarchs, they're all still there. They all still have their interests, but it is all kind of subordinated to the war effort now as war has a tendency to do that. Yeah, I mean, I feel like even I could have told Putin that that would happen. I'm still shocked by the apparent shock that Ukrainians sort of rallied to the extent that they did. It's, I always think that's a pretty natural human response, even yes. independent of justness of causes on paper. Yes, it is. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, I, you know, I don't, not that I have any interest in uh, defending the United States in any, in any sense, but I, but I can understand at a fundamental human level that when your country is invaded and your family is being, you know, in a basement worried that bombs are going to drop on their heads, you're not that worried about political differences. You're really just worried about survival and you're worried about, you know, uniting with anybody who's fighting the same people you are. So, you know, I get that. Um, I guess that's a good way to start asking about the uh, Azov Battalion and associated uh, far right and fascist contingents in that area. Or, I mean, in Russia, too, just the whole that whole mess and how it's talked about, you know? Yeah, that is that is one of the I mentioned it already. Russian propaganda is effective, especially I mean, all propaganda in, in essence, but in this context, Russian propaganda is effective precisely because it roots itself in some truth, mm -hmm. right? And that truth can vary from a 5% truth to a 25% truth to a 50% truth or whatever you want to call it, right? But there is some truth. Obviously, there are fascist formations in Ukraine. Azov is one. It is the prominent one, uh, primarily because it was incorporated directly into the Ukrainian armed forces. That's part of the reason why Azov has the sort of notoriety that it does. But if we go back to 2014, there were many different groups, right sector, so-called, you know, Pravoy sector, as it's called, you know, that is one uh, famous one, primarily because several of its leaders ended up in high ranking positions in the Ukrainian government. And that is to a large extent where you get this sort of narrative that Ukraine is a Nazi state. The right. idea being that these fascists, leaders of fascist formations rose to fairly prominent positions in the government. That's true. But it also is a bit of a distortion to say that just but their very presence makes Ukraine a Nazi state rather than to say that they were influential for a variety of reasons and actually did 
uh, uh, have some degree of influence. Certainly the oligarchs that employed them as on the street muscle believe mm-hmm. that they had some influence. These, you know, they, they've operated in a space somewhere between uh, fascist paramilitary, uh, criminal gang, uh, street gang, and, you know, and uh, community uh, activist group. I mean, a combination of all of those things, right? And um, so it's hard for us to wrap our heads around how that could be. How could you have a Nazi or neo-Nazi or partially neo-Nazi paramilitary force incorporated into your military and not be a Nazi state? Well, you have to have some context. You have to know that Azov makes up less than 5% of the overall Ukrainian armed forces. You have to understand that Azov is to a large extent concentrated in only certain areas, that part of the reason why these groups gained the notoriety that they did was because of their sort of viciousness in fighting against Russia's Nazi proxies in the east sure. there's a lot of reasons why and again like i said you know when you're when your home is being bombed you probably aren't going to care that much who that guy is who's defending your home you're just going to know that he's defending your home so in essence this is a really problematic aspect of the ukraine war because it does provide fodder for russia's propaganda which certainly plays to a lot of sympathies on the left um you know because again people like me have relatives buried in mass graves in Babi Yar and elsewhere people like me immediately uh you know get our you know sort of red flags go up and alarm bells go off when we start seeing ukrainian nazis attacking you know um I, my my great grandfather was murdered in 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 Minsk, and my other great grandfather was murdered in the ghetto in Odessa, precisely by these people, but or by their grandparents. Right. You know what I mean? So yeah. there, and and a lot of people in the Jewish diaspora uh, have those connections. Ukraine, and especially the city of Odessa, is the heart of uh, of uh, of the Jewish uh, of the Jewish people in the Soviet Union, going back to the time of the Russian Empire, prior to the Russian Revolution, even. Um, so Ukraine has that history and there's a reason why Tim Snyder titled his book, the bloodlands, you know, and, um, this is a very ugly part of, uh, our history. Anyway, I only bring all of that up to say that this is part of the reason why Russia's propaganda about Nazis is effective. Um, and, uh, it doesn't help that, um, a lot of the sympathies for, uh, the neo-Nazi elements come from the most deeply nationalistic elements of Ukraine. Um, mm-hmm. Ukraine has been involved since 1991 in the end of the Soviet Union in a nation building project. I mean, trying to build an actual country with a distinct cultural heritage and a distinct national identity out of the remnants of the Soviet Union, where uh, Ukrainian identity was was forcibly suppressed, where the Ukrainian language was forcibly suppressed and so forth, where Ukrainians weren't allowed to be Ukrainians. They were just Soviet citizens, you know? And um, so this project uh, since 1991 to really forge a national identity and a cultural identity that then gets enmeshed with reactionary politics, far right politics, that is of course the ultra nationalist and that then creates a problem where a regular person who's not a fascist not a nazi but does believe that ukraine as a nation should have its distinct identity and culture they then are transformed into caricatures by russian propaganda where they're all just nazis and nazi sympathizers and it's much more complicated than that um my family's all jews all my all my my uncle obviously my my father they're all jews and nobody has anything but negative things to say about what russia is doing none of them have anything but positive things to say about ukraine you think they don't know about nazis they do Mm -hmm. you think they don't know that there are nazis in ukraine they do there are nazis in the united states there was a nazi in the white house not too long ago we have nazis running for congress in every state in this country. So let's not uh, be too self-righteous about uh, Nazis and their presence in the state. I tended to push back a little just to say Nazi or, you know, fascist or something more precise than that. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I'm using Nazi because we're talking about a historic uh, connection here. You're right. Of course, 
fascist would probably be the more is the more appropriate word and fascist is also a loaded term with the way that the russians use it but, but sure we don't have time to get into all of the nuances <laughs> of that needless to say their conception of what a fascist is and what a nazi is is not the same as mine or ours in, in the united states so um I still want to, I don't want to spend all day on what people get wrong about Ukraine and stuff, but. um, It's important though. Those are important subjects to talk about because a lot of people just don't going to, they don't know history or they don't know all the nuances and they're going to repeat whatever sounds like the smartest talking point. Well, talk, say, let's say liberal centrist American mainstream media, um, these sort of Zelensky, at least initially when our attention spans were on it, um, him as this pure hero and stuff. Um, yes. And then, and then, you know, what you might call a tanky sort of, uh, and or f- f- uh, far right in America, apologetics for Putin. And as we discussed the idea that, you know, it's all this, this puppeteering from the United States and stuff. Right. Um, yeah, Ukraine has absolutely nothing to do with anything. They have no agency. They're not involved in the war. They're just they just take orders from Washington. Well, I mean, what's what's the most generous reading of the idea that there's this puppetry going on, especially now, as you were talking about a couple of years ago and stuff. But um, the fact that the U.S. seems, pre- you know, we're giving them uh, billions in aid and, and, and there's this interest in in Ukraine and stuff and the the. Oh, it's much, of- yeah, it's much deeper than that. I mean, the, you know, the, the idea, you know, it's not just some, uh, you know, Putin bootlicking tanky propaganda to say that the U.S. has been deeply and intimately involved with Ukraine. They have been. This is documented. Mm-hmm. It's not some conspiracy theory. You could I could pull up Washington Post articles talking about U.S. military operating in Western Ukraine, providing training to the Ukrainian military well before Russia ever invaded. The CIA was involved in having a program in Donbass where they sent to, uh, technical experts and advisors into Donbass to basically provide training to the various Ukrainian forces that were fighting against the Russians in Donbass. This program had been going on for several years. It was, well, at least publicly, they say that it ended, I think, in like 2017 or 2016. Uh, but that's not entirely clear. Um, and um, the U.S. has been involved in, in in myriad ways. The U.S. was involved in promoting Yushchenko in 2004, the so-called Orange Revolution, which is mm-hmm. to a large extent the origin of the uh, Russian propaganda meme right, about right. color revolutions. You know, right. And uh, Ukraine was one of the original, quote unquote, color revolutions of that period. Period. Um, and the U.S. was involved in promoting its favorite candidates, just as it did in Russia in the 1990s with Yeltsin mm-hmm. and so forth. So um, there is quite a bit of truth to the idea that Ukraine is very much subject to uh, U.S. meddling. At the same time, the idea that Ukraine is completely subordinate to the U.S. and just you know, acts on the diktats of the White House, that's, of course, nonsense. We saw that played out. I mean, First of all, we saw it in real time during the Trump years. I mean, Zelensky wanted nothing to do with Trump. The whole reason why Trump got impeached in the first place was because he was trying to do quid pro quo over arming the fucking Ukrainians. So it's like, let's not pretend that Russiagate didn't happen. Let's not pretend that we don't know all of the ways in which the United States was trying to use Ukraine, or I shouldn't even say the United States, various elements of the political class in the United States for their own reasons have been trying to manipulate within Ukraine. And this is true, actually, broadly speaking, that's true throughout the post-Soviet space, the former Soviet republics, Uh, less so depending on which country you're talking about, but Ukraine, because of its uh, orientation towards Europe, because of its geographic location, for a lot of different reasons, its strategic location, its agricultural output, its rich farmland. I mean, there's a thousand reasons why Ukraine was extremely important to the United States and to uh, other countries in the West. And so, yes, it is absolutely true. And Putin is not lying when he says that the United States is intimately involved with Ukraine. But that doesn't mean that it is a puppet of a puppet state of the U.S. It's certainly less of a puppet state of the U.S. than some other countries that we could point to. So, I mean, delving, um, I never know if I should go in the tanky direction or the uh, Ukrainian direction, but going back to your personal politics, 
can you differentiate your anti-imperialism, it says so right on the Twitter name, as opposed to, you know, tank, should I say tankies? Should I find a more... Um... I don't care. Yeah, tankies <laughs> fine. It doesn't matter to me. I mean, the, the issue is that I'm opposed to imperialism. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the difference. The difference is that I don't, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm sort of being flippant about it, but it's true. I oppose imperialism in all of its forms. And I use the tools of uh, uh, Marxism and Marxist analysis to try to d- differentiate what the imperialist forces are, how they are organized, what they are doing, and what is changing. And so part of what changed for me in my own political outlook was the nature of imperialism in the world that I live in, in the, in the pre- Pre, um, uh, in the pre-Trump years, we had uh, the continuation of basically the post-1991 status quo, where the United States is essentially this single global imperial power at the head of a global imperial system, one that is global in reach and in scope, one that uses all forms of war making uh, for the purposes of coercion uh, against states and um, any potential rivals and so forth. I mean, I don't have to explain how the U.S. is imperial. I think I'm assuming everyone listening to us understands that but the 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 thinking that animated my politics leading up to that period was this sort of formulation which i think was fundamentally correct and i think that what's happened since then and and trump is only the most obvious example of this is that we have had a fragmentation of the uh, uh global chessboard in a sense where now what we w- w- what's begun to emerge is a sort of uh form of competing imperialism and the competing imperialisms, as I mean, Russia in Ukraine is only one example of that. But the competing imperialisms, this is something that uh, Patrick Bond, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but Patrick Bond was on my show in like 2017. And he and I debated and I disagreed with him at the time. And I've come around five years later to his position uh, that countries like China and Russia needed to be understood as not imperial powers in themselves, but sub-imperial powers. In other words, that they had some of the characteristics of imperial powers without necessarily rising to the level of what the United States has, which is true. I mean, the, the, the U.S. currency dominates the globe. The dollar is the world's reserve currency. You can see the U.S. Treasury can literally shut down an entire country overnight, as they did with Russia, freezing two thirds of their uh, uh, cash reserves, which is like unthinkable 100 years ago. You know, so the level of imperial power that the U.S. wields is extraordinary. At the same time, though, Recent developments have moved us into a position where Russia is now a regional imperial power that seeks to have a global reach. We also see that it w- with um, in a different form with China, with a more economic centered approach. We see it also with Turkey. Turkey has intervened in three wars in the last three years. Turkey has won the war in Libya. Turkey won the war for Azerbaijan uh, against Armenia, a Russian ally in Nagorno-Karabakh. Turkey has military bases on the Horn of Africa. Turkey is operating as a neo-Ottoman sub-imperial power, which is exactly how Erdogan has described himself, neo-Ottoman in their outlook, where they see Turkey's natural reach stretching to the Uyghurs of Xinjiang in Western China, all of whom are Turkic peoples, Kazakh, Uzbek, uh, Tajik. These are all Turkic-speaking, Turkic-language, Turkic peoples. Erdogan sees himself as the inheritor of the Ottoman legacy. What can we call this but imperialism? Turkey, in competition with Russia, is a 400-year-old rivalry. The Ottoman and Russian empires fought dozens of wars. I mean, Crimea's whole history is the, is the, is the struggle between the Ottomans and the Russians, right? So yeah. what we've begun to, and you see uh, uh, Turkey operating in the Black Sea, Turkey operating in the Eastern Mediterranean, Turkey coming up against Russia in several ways. So I only bring up all of these points to say that there are so many developments in the last five, six years that point to a new global chessboard in which you have multiple competing imperialisms and the continued um, uh, slow but sure decline of the United States only opens up more space for that kind of competition. And that competition is going to make the world a much more uh, um, 
dangerous place for some people, a much more unstable place. And I'm not saying that that means that, you know, Pax Americana is good. It isn't. I want to see the end of the U.S. empire. But we should also be clear eyed and understanding that the end of U.S. imperial hegemony means. Well, let me put it this way, as I as I've said, for some people, um, what what comes after U.S. unipolar global imperial hegemony? more imperialism. That's the problem. That's the problem we have is that what comes next? More of the same. I mean, sure, Putin's been, you know, trying to get that Cold War sequel going. And and I realized there was a nostalgia for the, you know, the USSR when Russia felt important and was more important. But some of the propaganda of it being better when it wasn't just the US, like it was better for the world somehow. I found fascinating that Putin kind of put it that way just because not just about, I don't know, his, his empire, but just like that, you know, that, that it balances the U S I don't know if there's any true to that. I mean, the Cold War was miserable for lots of tiny countries. Right. I mean, we were, there is some truth to it, but there's also a lot of, uh, um, sort of, there's a lot of sleight of hand when Putin says that. Right. So (laughs) there is truth to the fact that, um, the idea of a bipolar world that we had during the Cold War was, did have some, um, excuse me, that did have some kind of um, stabilizing element to it, right? That there were these balanced sort of forces existing in the world, a capitalist West and a socialist East. And, uh, you know, countries could exist in, in by selecting one or the other camp. I mean, Cuba is a great example. Once the Soviet Union collapsed, Cuba almost collapsed itself, right? Cuba was so dependent upon the Soviet Union because of the nature of the embargo and its geographic relation to the United States that, you know, the 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 Soviet Union in the Eastern Bloc and the Socialist Bloc, it represented an alternative. And once that alternative went away, this is the famous TINA, right? There is no alternative, T-I-N-A, you know, that uh, once the Soviet Union and socialism or communism or, you know, the alleged socialism went away, that that then created a, a situation where all countries simply had to bend the knee to the United States. And that is true, in a mm-hmm. sense. At the same time, the talk of so-called multipolar world, which is the terminology that the Russians like to employ. I mean, this is, uh, I mean, it is absolutely um, propaganda in the sense that the notion of a multipolar world is basically goes hand in hand with the notion of Russian imperial revanchism. Right. So so in in their conception of it, multipolarity doesn't mean, you know, that uh, the United States, like all other countries, has to abide by international law and there will be a universal set of standards and rules or anything like that. No, it simply means that the United States doesn't get to dominate every place in the world by itself, that other players want to get a piece, you know, and um, this, of course, ties into the philosophical, uh, you know, sort of. I guess you could call it uh, uh, um, ideological discourse in Russia um, that is probably most obviously embodied by Alexander Dugin. Alexander Dugin, who is the most prominent of the uh, Russian fascist uh, philosophers and thinkers, he, he he famously has written a number of books, including so-called found, The Foundations of Geopolitics, which was the title of one of his books, uh, and Fourth Political Theory, which is another one of his books. And his ideas are, uh, I'm not saying that he is the, you know, Putin's rest Putin, as he's been called in in Western publications, but he does have influence and his ideas have been taken up by Putin. And basically his idea is that um, the great enemy of the world is Western liberalism. Right. Yeah. That, ever, that the that Western liberalism seeks to dominate the world and turn the world into a, uh, you know, transgendered and gay uh, utopia that uh, destroys all traditional traditionalism and destroys all uh, fundamental um, principles of um, human existence, basically. Right. That everything becomes subsumed to Western capitalism and identity politics and this and that. Right. And of course, you can see this in Putin's propaganda. He weaponizes a lot of these ideas and it's very and it has a tremendous amount of traction a yeah. lot of places in the global south agree with him about yeah. that a lot of places in the uh, developing world agree with him 
about that. So there's a potency to the Russian propaganda that needs to be recognized because it's not all, um, it's not all, it, it can't all just be chalked up to, um, you know, the talking points of Dugan. They resonate for a lot of the world. And um, this is a big problem. Then the West is beginning to understand this. I just, I just did a video on a piece in Forbes talking about how, um, you know, if you live in the West, you think that Ukraine is just killing it in the information war. But if you go to other parts of the world, it's just not the case. Russia's narratives have a tremendous amount of traction in a lot of places. In a lot of places, people don't care. People don't care. You want to say, oh, well, the Russians are committing war crimes. They're like, yeah, so what? America commits war crimes every day. What do you want, to, what do you want us to do about it? You know, there's a lot of that in the world. There's a lot of people in the world who see this conflict very differently from how I see it, from how people who, um, you know, believe in uh, human rights and other things they... There are many ways of looking at this issue. That's the problem. And multipolar, a multipolar world, according to Putin and Dugin, represents a way for them to be able to mold public opinion away from what they see as the sort of totalitarian control of Western liberal discourse. There's a couple of directions I could go after that. Um, one of them is that on Twitter, I have seen basically plenty of versions of so what if Russia's committing war crimes? You know, the U.S. commits them every day. I mean, I don't know if you saw that your experience was with when Russia invaded that there was maybe the highest levels of sort of whataboutism that I've ever seen in a conflict, including with people who were my ostensive allies, certainly close to your allies, where to care at all was almost buying into Western propaganda. Oh, yeah. Because we're talking about white people you know yeah. whatever. To, to, to say that the russians are committing war crimes makes you automatically a cia nato <laughs> shill and gatekeeper how much are they paying you this and that oh i know believe me I should show you my emails <laughs> or i mean even even a more subtle version of that say with people who don't you know throw those cards on the table just that i don't know I, it's easy to buy into a narrative and when when suddenly the media focuses on this one war and when there's you know, a big country invading a small one, it kind of pushes a lot of our buttons. But also seeing some BBC voices over city under siege, I, I start to think, you know, they they love this. They haven't been this happy since since the Balkan War, where it's, you know, scrappy white people under siege. And I feel like we do care more about that. There is something no very... Wrong yeah, whiteness, wrong there. white whiteness plays very much into uh, the coverage of this war. Whiteness uh, plays very much into how Western uh, public opinion has been shaped around this war. Um, I mean, I, there were even instances where they just accidentally said it openly. Like I couldn't, I can't believe that they're doing this to a white country. You know right, what I mean? Right. You know, I mean, if this, this, this sort of thing is relegated to, uh, you know, the, 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 the brown people in places like Yemen or, you know, wherever. Um, yeah, absolutely. But I don't know why anybody would think that somehow uh, uh, white supremacy and colonial attitudes just simply disappear appeared in Europe and the United States. Of course they didn't. This is, this is, this is still Europe. This is still the, the, you know, the heart of colonialism. This is still the United States, the beating pulse of global empire. I mean, why this is, this is the part of that, that I always, uh, you know, push back on people when they do that. What about, you know, what about sort of response? And it's like, so I don't understand what your point is. What, what's your point? You want your, your point is that the U S is imperialist. Yes. Your point is that the U.S. commits these crimes? Of course. That's my whole political life has been dedicated to fighting against those things. So just because the name changes and now Russia is doing exactly the same thing, why would I not be opposing that? A lot of the people I've encountered are like, and therefore we should talk about Yemen instead. And we should talk about Yemen. I mean, they're not wrong there, but. But that's um, not a, that, that's not a, that's, that's, that's not a rejoinder. It's not a, no. it's a non sequitur. It's like saying, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like your my, my house is on fire, but I should also pay attention to the fact that like, you know, it's flooding in the basement, you know, right. it's like, yeah, yeah, I mean, both of those things are happening. But again, my point, my, my point was that when people, uh, uh, and, and this is especially true of like, you know, the degenerate types of the, on the left, like the gray zone people and, you know, the various tanky elements or whatever. I don't typically use the word tanky because that's a, that's a weird, like Stalin Trotsky 
an anarchist left wing intra fighting thing that I'm not that interested in, but tanky is fine as far as for understanding who we're talking about. You know, what I, I was mean? a little more struck by your use of the word degenerate, just because my association with that is uh, degenerated worker state. <laughs> yes. When you say when you say that degenerate, though, I think you know a, a right someone on the far right's about to speak oh i think but but i think that elements on the left are part of the far right in a sense i mean they, they are the red that both bri- makes sense and it's nonsense but yes yeah. of course <laughs> they, they 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 are in a sense because i mean this is what red brown means and this is what dugan is dugan's whole point his fourth political theory is to to define it basically it's left and right against the center that's the that's the dynamic right. that he describes in his book, and that is the dynamic of Russia's propaganda, right? They want propaganda that appeals to elements on the far left and that appeals to elements on the far right. And so you end up with this bizarre situation where certain elements on the far left and far right begin to converge. And that is what you see with like Tucker Carlson bringing Max Blumenthal onto his show to talk about Ukraine, right? Max Blumenthal ostensibly is a leftist. I would debate that, but that's beside the point. He's ostensibly on the left. Tucker Carlson very much on the right, yet they have the same view. How could that be? How is this possible? The answer is because this is crafted. This is designed. This is manufactured propaganda designed to appeal to these different segments and to unite them against the dominant consensus in the United States. And it's been somewhat effective. I mean, it's been somewhat effective. We do see this uh, coming through. I mean, Tucker Carlson is the most popular uh, primetime news host by far. It's not even close. And I mean, he provides a platform that allows people that call themselves uh, socialists to come on there and talk bullshit about Ukraine. So yeah, I mean, it has been successful in some senses, but um, Ultimately, I don't think it's been uh, uh, totally successful because, as you can see, public opinion around the war has been roundly against Russia from the very beginning, and they've done very little to move public opinion on that front. That's where we get into this question of whether or not they care and whether or not they're focusing their propaganda in the global south that i mean the author of that forbes article i referenced earlier has made the point that uh, and actually i have it right here actually chasm technology is the name of a, a of a technology consulting firm that recently did a study looking into russian narratives online on social media and they found that the vast majority let me see what, what is it that the vast majority of information narratives from russia have targeted countries in the BRICS. That would be Brazil, Mm -hmm. India, China, South Africa. And you see, actually, all of those countries have a tremendous amount of sympathy for Russia's position. So they've been somewhat successful. It's been a mixed bag for them, I think. Can can you explore like the current right just a little bit more in terms of this topic? Because I think I got firmly stuck in the high school, I hate George W. Bush mentality of, you know, what the right is. And the the Trump era hit almost like I I couldn't even quite comprehend that this was the right and this is this is a very older version of the right this is but um, I don't know what like what what do you see has changed there and like h- how to deal with that as compared to say the the, the neocon um, right wing like is is it just a is it just the forties America first stuff and like. It's some of that. It's some of that. I would I would say that, um, again, uh, not to betray my 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 Marxism here too much, but I think the politics comes second. What comes first is capital. What comes first is the economics of all of this. And what we've found uh, since 2016 is that there's been a clear split within the ruling class uh, and within the capitalist class. And that that split can be defined in a number of ways. Um, I think the most obvious is the nature of capital and the nature of the sec- segments of capital and how they've aligned. The far right has been bankrolled and supported and driven into power by elements within the U.S. ruling class that are attached to, uh, you could call it dirty industries, heavy industries, petroleum products, the petrochemicals industry, um, certain segments of um 
you know, heavy industry construction, things like that. There are elements. And then of course, the sort of petty bourgeois classes, right? The small business owners, the medium sized business owners and so forth. These are the elements of capital that have been driving the far right. And they are to a large extent, not uh, what you would call transnational capital. They are to a large extent national, national in their orientation, national in their uh, uh, economic agendas, right? So if you're talking about major um, construction firms, if you're talking about steel producers, if you're talking about, uh, you know, some of the heavier polluting industries, uh, you know, these kinds of industries, they have to a large extent uh, lined up behind Trump and behind people like Trump and have, pushed forward a, a, a deeply reactionary politics that will justify their continued existence, right? Because if it were up to the, uh, the elements of the ruling class in Silicon Valley and Hollywood and elsewhere, they would abolish them or legislate them out of existence or drive some of these people into, uh, into retirement or what have you, right? So there is a, there's an internecine conflict within the ruling class of capital right now. Um, and you can see this play out in a number of ways. Peter Thiel is a great example of that. Peter Thiel is, of course, a Silicon Valley billionaire, but he's also a fascist. He's one of the primary people bankrolling Trump and bankrolling the far right. And he and Elon Musk and people like that have pushed themselves uh, into alignment with the right against other elements of capital, especially mm-hmm. transnational capital. Transnational capital doesn't like nationalistic policies. They don't like trade wars and tariffs. They don't like ultranationalist politics. They want the full neoliberal, full spectrum experience where they can move their money in, in and out of countries. They can invest anywhere. And so I don't have to explain neoliberalism, I think. So in, in essence, to me, the fundamental divide is a divide within capital itself, the nature of the capitalist ruling class and who is going to control and set the agenda in the future. There's a reason why families like the Mercers bankroll Trump, while other families and other private institutions and other billionaires find him revolting. Okay, and I think that fundamental conflict is one that also can be generalized more broadly globally. Putin is the, to a large extent, the hub, the central, the central node of a global far right fascist movement, right? And this fascist movement sees itself as challenging the hegemony of Western liberalism. Now, whether that's true or not, we can debate that. I think that's something of a misrepresentation, but. Either way, the dynamic is there. That's how they present themselves. And there are a lot of people, a lot of people around the world and in the United States who absolutely identify with that. Okay, because they will see, just like Putin and Dugan, they will see the real elements of destruction as being liberal, the liberal agenda, Hollywood, Silicon Valley censorship, all of these, all of these different hot button issues for the right, they all get sort of uh, amalgamated into this broader idea of fighting against the totalitarian liberal, right? right? And that the totalitarian liberal, the idea of a totalitarian liberal is a fundamental product of decades of neoliberal austerity and neoliberal crushing of society, right? And this is in some senses a put a, a, a sort of a whiplash, a, a pushback against that. Um, and, you know, you see this in a lot of different forms. You see it in uh, the, uh, well, critical race theory is, a, you know, the fight against critical race theory is a perfect example of that, right? The idea that the liberals are indoctrinating the children, no different than it was in the 1930s, just as you pointed out, but it has a different connotation now, because now we are into a period of global breakdown of, of, of a um, trans, there, there was a, something of a transnational neoliberal consensus from 1991 until I don't know, sometime around 2010 to 2015. And by the time we get to 2016, it all is out in the open. Brexit is a perfect Mm -hmm. example of that. Breaking with the sort of liberal consensus of the European Union. Of course, a far right movement bankrolled by some of the worst scum that exist in the UK and around the world. And then that 
leads us right, what, seven, eight months later, right into Trump's election. And then from there, of course, Bolsonaro in Brazil, we could mm-hmm. t- talk about Modi in, in India. There are many people that, and, and individuals and countries that we can point to that are part of this dynamic. And I think that it's important, at least in my view, it's important to understand these things at the uh, uh, economic level and then translate those economic conflicts into the politics. And I mean, that's, of course, you know, it's classic Marx based superstructure stuff, you know, but that's the idea. I don't want to spend too much time on what is worse, but you have such a, a fabulous analysis of these changes. But I mean, you know, you've critiqued the neoliberal world order and U.S. currency being in every crevice of the world. And now we're talking about reactionary actual fascist backlashes to that um and that obviously accompanies a lot of like homophobic stuff i mean russia loves that all these all the bad things that goes with that i mean i don't is it i mean is, is that worse than what we had before and like is, is the fact that maybe there's some truth behind a backlash in the terms of the u.s being all-encompassing if nothing else none of the insane things <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. It depends on it depends on how you look at it. I mean, were was were the were the Middle Ages better than the Roman Empire? <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, if you were a yeah, slave in Rome, right. it would depend. You know what I mean? I mean, mm-hmm. if you were a slave in Rome, then the end of Rome was cool. You're, yeah, you know what I mean. But like, if you were a Roman, the end of Rome was a disaster. So, you know, I, 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 I know think, who we are. So. Well, I mean, it depends, though. It depends on how you it depends on how you look at it. I mean, I I'm deeply concerned that what we're now entering is a period of overlapping and mutually reinforcing crises globally, that the crisis that we're describing and talking about here is only one of a series of crises. Uh, climate change is an obvious one, but there's others as well. And that these things are sort of building uh, 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 building a kind of uh, momentum outside of the control of any individual or any group of individuals or any country or any group of countries, that it has a momentum of its own leading us towards an extreme crisis that is difficult for us to wrap our heads around. And I'm concerned that that is, to a large extent, where we're headed. And as we uh, become a more fragmented world with competing power blocks and competing, you know, baskets of currencies and competing ideas of what is or isn't a human right and competing ideas of everything, um, that it's going to be not only is it going to be harder to have any kind of collective action that goes without saying, but it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know what I mean? That we are Mm -hmm. that we are writing our own death warrants you know what i mean all of us in a sense you know so um i mean not to be too morbid about it but i mean i do think that that we are headed for a very dark period that this is only the beginning of a very dark period and that um the job of the left and as it's historically been i mean let me just back up for a second i think that one of the things that should be said and i think that uh, people on the left would do would, would be wise to continue to keep this in their mind that the left, especially in the United States, has historically been extremely weak. Um, it's been weak for a long time, certainly since the 1930s, it's in comparison to the 1930s. And um, what the left has uh, lacked in its ability to influence politics and its ability to organize people, it has always been able to maintain a good analysis. That when the left is, the left may be weak and may be unable to affect the levers of power, but it has historically been able to analyze the global situation and to provide insights that liberals can never do right and this is one of the great things about being on the left is that you're supposed to be able to have that kind of an analysis and so i think that the job of the left now especially is to provide that analysis that is clear that makes people understand like this is the nature of things whether you like it or not whether you want it to be that way or not whether you wish it to be different or not material reality is material reality and we have to deal with things as they exist and we don't have any any chance of a global left-wing movement that can challenge the currently uh, dominant neoliberal versus global far-right movements. And so that's our task is to build that. And part of the way that we build that is by providing the kind of analysis of the global situation that we can. I mean, that's what the left is always positioned to do. And that's its historic task. And it's failed miserably in recent years. And 
part of the frustration that I have is in constantly feeling like I'm fighting a losing battle on that mm-hmm. front. Yeah. Um, I don't want to keep you forever, but I have a couple more sort of less sure. smoothly integrated questions. Some of our other non-Serbian people um, had some stuff they wanted to pick your brain on. Yeah. Um, one of them is, and I, I'm, this is kind of my my uh, thing as well, is do, do, you're an anti-imperialist, obviously, but in terms of pacifism or not, just war theory, Any do you subscribe to anything beyond anti-imperialism in terms of violence no i mean i'm not a pacifist um i don't i i I don't subscribe to any particular kind of uh theory of that kind i think that um like i said i mean uh uh the the conflict is built in to this system we live in a capitalist system by its very nature conflict will exist and it will be forever that way until we can devise and and, and build a better system and a better world. And um, I think that um, pacifism um, is noble and uh, some of the greatest activists in our, in our, in our traditions are people like Quakers and others who really do represent the pacifist tradition. And I have, you know, extraordinary respect for people who uh, are able to live those kind of values. Um, But at the same time, I do believe that there are uh, instances where we need to fight. Mm -hmm. And I believe in the, uh, the morally righteous and just struggle of uh, formerly colonial peoples to fight against their colonial masters and to overthrow them by force and to establish their own societies. I think that the anti-colonial struggles in Africa in the 1960s were noble by and large, I, despite problems that may have existed in this or that country. Um, I, I think that the struggle against uh, 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 Nazis in the 1940s was absolutely righteous, a righteous struggle, despite the all of the other reasons that we could point to about Churchill and Roosevelt and what the U.S. wanted and the British wanted. Ultimately, fascism had to be defeated and it had to be defeated by force and there was no other way. So um, in that sense, I, I guess I don't I, I can't describe myself as a pacifist, but as a uh, um, uh, a citizen of the United States in the 21st century, um, I'm about as close to being a pacifist without being a pacifist as you can be because every single war I oppose because every single war is an imperialist war. So it's very easy for me to oppose just about every war because we don't fight righteous wars. We are an imperial monster. So, you know, that's just the nature of it. Now, if I lived in another country, in another society, in another time, I might be able to have a different view on that. But as an American living in the 21st century, Nah, fuck war. And do you feel like it's not a useful use of your time to try to judge, particularly the you know the colonial revolts against colonialism? I mean, I have a habit of picking at tactics and sort of reading about you know uh, like the Haitian Revolution, the most justifiable war perhaps that I've ever heard of, and how absolutely brutal that became. I mean, do you feel like it's just not? you know, your job to talk to, to, to critique things or if it's just, I mean, I do you have say, a standard or just <laughs> you're, you're winging it, which is no, fine because no. you're winging it pretty damn well. No, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that I'm winging it. I, like I said, I think that, I think that each conflict has to be analyzed in itself and, mm-hmm. and we have to understand the material forces at play in each conflict. I mean, Haiti is a perfect example. Haiti is, a, is, well, to use more modern terminology, a super exploited colony, not just a colony, but a super exploited one, one that quite literally built the wealth of France, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and so to struggle against that and to overthrow it is essentially two revolutions. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm mostly gonna, you know, uh, I'm I'm mostly basing this off of uh, CLR James's classic text Black Jacobins, which in my view is the definitive book on the Haitian Revolution. And uh, CLR James's analysis was that uh, I'm, I'm going to butcher it. So don't I'm not going to say CLR James analysis, but the basic takeaway that one could have from that is that there were multiple conflicts happening simultaneously, that if you were a Haitian and you were struggling for freedom, you were struggling against both the French and the British and simultaneously your your domestic class of uh, 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 comprador 
bourgeois elites who were enriching themselves at the you know as middlemen to France. So there were multiple conflicts within the broader conflict, and that's why you have differences between Toussaint Louverture and Jean Jacques Dessalines. Dessalines, of course, was basically like you know we got to execute these people, you know. Toussaint was more like, well, we need to negotiate. We need to be a little bit more, you know, whatever. Right. So differences in tactics. I don't think that we would I don't think it would be appropriate for us to say who was right and who was wrong, who had the better strategy, who had the worst strategy. In my view, um, there is a certain need for ruthlessness in those situations because you cannot allow the system to reconstitute itself. Similarly, in the Russian Revolution, I'm I'm firmly of the opinion that the idea of leaving the czar and his family family to just live out their days somewhere in Siberia or something was probably not a good idea. That probably yeah, would not have been that. that probably would not have been a good idea. That would have allowed for a rallying cry of reaction. It would have led to an expansion of the civil war potentially. Anyway, there's a lot of what if <laughs> scenarios. My point is simply to say that I can't condemn any particular violent action without putting it in the broader context of what the conflict really was. You know, similar like with the Russian Revolution and the Russian Civil War. Nine other countries invaded Russia. So the war instantly changed. It became something else. And so anyway, I guess I'm I, I'm not trying to dance around giving you an answer. It's just there's not no, a clear it's answer to not. that question. I mean, I think that is the answer. And I'm I'm also a pacifist, except when it comes to, you know, literally direct, like <laughs> direct self-defense, I would say. But I get I get obsessed with these conflicts and trying to figure out what's, you know, wrong or right about them. But, you know, like you could I could talk myself into opposing like the Warsaw ghetto uprising, because what if there was Wehrmacht people who were drafted and it's sort of not their fault. But like you can't oppose that no, because that's I, yeah. crazy. You're right. No, you're right. <laughs> I, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. You can't think that way because to think that way is to basically remove yourself from politics. I mean, this is politics that we're talking about. And I mean, this requires us to not just have a position or an opinion, but to do a little bit of work, a little bit of analysis to understand, okay, well, what are the forces at play and why is this happening? And, you know, this is this is part of the problem in our society is that people don't want to do that kind of mental work. And because they don't want to do that mental work, they're looking for someone to, to, to just feed them some talking points. And the problem is that when you get that level of uh, sort of discourse, then it's no longer actually seeking truth. It's just basically just a bunch of nonsense. Um, I also, this is, uh, this is, well, this is sort of apropos of nothing, but um, someone uh, wanted to ask about the, the Rojavan revolution and, uh, and basically, do you have any hope for that succeeding? No, what? no, not today. Now, not now. today. No, unfortunately not. The situation has changed again. I mean, mm -hmm. Turkey just invaded again. Turkey yeah. just sent in military two days ago. Um, and they've already been occupying Afrin. They've already been uh, controlling that area. The Turks seem to have made a deal with Assad now. Erdogan and Assad are kind of making up, sort of, after years of really being bitterly opposed to each other. And part of the reason there is because uh, um, Erdogan wants Assad to deliver the Kurds. You know, um, or I mean, deliver the PKK slash mm -hmm. the Kurds, you know, obviously. Um, and uh, Assad has his reasons uh, for needing Turkey because Assad sees Russia getting battered and Russia no longer being as reliable as they had been, say, from 2015 to 2018. Russia may be uh, exiting out of Syria and Assad is looking to make a little bit of peace for himself and maybe secure himself and, you know, his own safety. And so he's making a deal with uh, Erdogan. And unfortunately, that probably that probably forecloses the future for anything like uh, what we've been calling, you know, Rojava. Um, I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say that definitively because I can't possibly know how things might evolve. But uh, Rojava was, to to a large extent, uh, a product of the Syrian war. And now that the Syrian war has kind of ended to a large extent, and Assad is kissing and making up with other dictators in the region. Hard for me to see how Kurt, how the um, um, you know the um, the SDF or the excuse me the uh, PKK and its um, you know offshoot or whatever you want to call it you know how they can 
survive, especially given the fact that now with the Ukraine war, Turkey as the central NATO member, they're now making demands about Kurds from Sweden and Finland. They're making demands that they be handed over. I mean, Turkey's in the driver's seat here. And unfortunately, when Turkey's in the driver's seat, the Kurds are the ones who lose. Is there any kind of um, community like that or area that's that's worked out to you or or uh, I don't know is that is that a worthwhile endeavor when they when they invariably seem to I think not get anywhere and frequently not through their own fault? <laughs> uh, a tough question. I think that um, look, I think that any endeavor for human liberation is 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 worthwhile. I, I wouldn't say that uh, we should you know you should just abandon all hope. You know what I mean and just cling to. It. I mean, I I don't want to live that way. I have young children. You know, I can't live like that. You know, um, I can't think that way. I can't go through every day that way. So I wouldn't tell anybody else to live that way. Um, I do think that hope is important. I think that having a vision for liberation is important, but I do think to your point that um, it is worth um, taking a, taking a long, hard look in the mirror and politically in the mirror and, um, you know, evaluating how things have gone and why they've gone the way they've gone. And, you know, I mean, I I mean, example of that would be, um, I mean, there's there's a there's a number of them, but the one that I was thinking of would be Marx in 1871. He wrote the Civil War in France, which is one of, in my opinion, it's one of his best books. And uh, the Civil War in France is all about taking stock of 1871 and the uh, and the Paris Commune and the mm-hmm. uprising of the Commune and and how it was crushed and why it was crushed and and what forces conspired to crush it and what were the reasons for that? What were the material reasons for that? Why did the Prussians basically ally with their enemies and allow the crush? of the commune right so anyway i only bring up that example not to like toot marx's horn he doesn't need that i mean to say that that is an example of taking stock of the failure of a revolutionary movement and understanding why it failed for the purposes of building something that won't fail in the future and and you know i know that i i'm sure that many people listening don't have a necessarily positive take on the bolsheviks or whatever but lenin saw himself as the inheritor of the legacy of the paris commune he saw the Bolsheviks as learning directly the lessons of 1871 in Paris and applying it to 1917 in Russia. And I think that that is a really important, I mean, it's one of many things that I think are extremely important to take from uh, Lenin's works is that understanding that we can look at history, evaluate our own failures as revolutionaries, evaluate our own failures, and then use that to inform our future successes. I think that that is critical. Um, I don't know what the future holds for the Kurds uh, in Rojava. Um, I hope that they're um, able to at least live peacefully. I don't think that Rojava itself continues as, a, as the entity that it has been. Um, but I don't know. I mean, a lot of things can change. A lot can happen. Um, I know that the Kurds had at one time made overtures to the Russians when the Americans were unwilling to uh, oust Assad. (laughs) And I mean, weird, strange bedfellows have been made and stranger relations have occurred. So uh, we shall we shall see. But uh, I'm not particularly hopeful for Rojava. It does always go that way with the bedfellows. Um, So the old host of of non-servium used to ask this question to all the guests, and that is, how would I get a cappuccino in your political utopia? and apparently me, like I is the important part. It's not, it's not you. It's not your preferences. How would I get a cappuccino in your political utopia or would I be able to obviously? Well, uh, <laughs> how would you get a cappuccino in my political utopia? Well, I think you would probably just ask for one. And it would be provided to you. I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. I mean, is this fully automated luxury gay space communism or whatever the meme is? Uh, you Maybe know, the, it is. You know, the idea <laughs> the idea that resources are infinite, that there are no that there's no limit to uh, production and uh, technological innovation to the point where you could get a cappuccino just by thinking of it. And then it would materialize right next to you. And uh, I would, of course, drink a black coffee because that's all I drink these days. But uh, I would hope that could materialize for me. Hell, just hook it right into my veins. That's how I operate nowadays. So that would be fine. I, 
I mean, I think that's a perfectly, the word utopia, I think, allows for, you know, replicators and, well, your mind cappuccino is perfect. I yeah, I would, I, well, I mean, thinking about it, I, w- I, I guess it would, it would, uh, it would be some kind of synth- synthesized coffee beans that would not require slave labor and the exploitation of people in Colombia and elsewhere and would uh, break the, uh, the, the exploitative chain of the coffee trade and all of that. I mean, if I really thought about it, I suppose I would want it to be some kind of, you know, synthetic coffee that is identical in every way to real coffee minus all of the exploitation. <laughs> if that, if that's a acceptable answer. It is. And it's sort of a more familiar market-esque answer uh to me which is you know i'm a market anarchist not to shock you but uh (laughs) that sort of is the dream yeah i mean you know it's 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 interesting you know i haven't talked with i haven't talked about anarchism in so long you know i i have right behind me i have so many anarchist books you wouldn't even believe it i have like oh my god here right here right at my hand here we go here's here's one there's one okay there's one. I have. Oh my god! I have tons of anarchist stuff. I'm I'm very anarcho friendly, even though even well, though we like I don't to hear consider that. myself an anarchist anymore. Um, and I find it very strange how how difficult it is to be able to communicate among these very uh, superficial divides on the left when I don't think that that's. I don't think that's the way I don't think that's the way it should be. Um, I certainly don't think that um, anarchists are always fair to Marxists. And I certainly don't think that Marxists are always fair to anarchists. And I think that all of the historical reasons for that are kind of dumb at this point. So we should figure out a way to be better about that on the left. I mean, the Marx Marxists, perhaps I get I get itchy when you start adding Leninist and uh, particularly Maoist to your name. But then I well, get... Marxism Leninism is a is a loaded term because that denotes Stalin, you know. And Marxism Leninism as an ideology, I also can't. I don't use that term because it denotes Stalinism. Mm-hmm. Um, but Lenin as a thinker and a theorist is totally separate from the ideology that we call Marxism Leninism. Marxism Leninism became the state religion of the Soviet Union. It was it was the orthodoxy of the Soviet mm-hmm. Union. So to say the term Marxism Leninism is to denote a whole history, you know, whereas if you talk about Marx or you talk about Lenin, you're talking about those individuals, the things that they wrote, the things that they thought about, the things that they did. Um, those to me are of tremendous value. Marxism, Leninism, as an ideology and as an identification, I do not, I, I, I don't identify with. Yeah, there's a lot of direct sources that you're talking about that I have not, that I haven't cracked and almost haven't tried to because that's that's just daunting text to well, me. Well, I mean, it, I well, okay, if you want ones that are, that are not daunting. I mean, this is so obvious, but the Communist Manifesto sure. is very, is very, is, but I mean, it's eminently readable. Even yeah. today, it's eminently readable and it does lay out a lot of the key ideas. Obviously, when you get into the deeper ones, it's harder. Um, I mean, Lenin's imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, I think is the most important, uh, that along with state and revolution. I mean, if you read those two books, each of them is like a hundred pages. You can read mm-hmm. it, you know, in, in not that long. And um, I think that they have a tremendous amount of value in them. Um, even, and, and I will admit, I read them as somebody who was very, had, had a tremendous amount of like icky feeling about Lenin. You know what I mean? Okay. This was like a villain in my mind, you know? Mm-hmm. And then only when I read it and I was like, wow, that's actually extremely insightful and wow, that really changes the way that I think about some of these things. And it's amazing how, how much you can learn from things that you thought were off limits. I mean, that's fair. And that's, um, you know, like there are people who don't want to use the Unabomber's uh, theorem because he's the Unabomber and it's a little less abstract in politics than math, but there's still an element of like, you can probably look at it, you know, I read 30 pages of Mein Kampf and I, I didn't learn anything except how 
self-aggrandizing Hitler was, but sometimes well, you can learn stuff. Well, and, and that's and that's a good point because Mein Kampf is not a deeply theoretical book. It's really, it's really it, not. <laughs> it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have a tremendous amount of value to somebody trying to understand the world. I mean, it has a lot of value if you were trying to understand Hitler. If you're trying and to understand his self-hyping. How he, you know. Yeah, how he thought, why he thought, what he thought, etc. I mean, it has value in that regard. But uh, Marx or Lenin or people, like, I mean, these were theorists. These were people mm-hmm. that were grappling with very large ideas and whether you agree or disagree with their conclusions just by reading what they wrote and how they thought i think that there's a lot of value in that as there is for um reading um bakunin to some extent although i found bakunin a bit less interesting than kropotkin in terms of reading uh anarchist theory malatesta as well to some extent um though i will admit that i mean obviously i mean they never they never really did it for me the way that marx did so you know have you ever read a right-wing text that you feel like you got something out of oh absolutely i read murray rothbard's toward a new liberty and fully understood how oh, debased, i read that one too <laughs> how debased anarcho-capitalism is i mean how utterly despicable the just the very notion is and it didn't even dawn on me until i read his book how uh, how awful it was you know so yeah i mean there's a okay there's a tremendous amount of value. Uh, Hayek's Road to Serfdom has a lot of value in it. I mean, mm-hmm. you understand everything from the Alex Jones ecosystem to the nature of the Libertarian Party when you mm-hmm. read that shit. You know what I mean? So <laughs> it's like there's a lot there's a lot of value to be gained from right wing texts. Bigna Brzezinski's books are extremely valuable if you want to understand how the U.S. ruling class, uh, the U.S. Uh, foreign policy elites think and thought uh kissinger's books for the same reason you know what i mean if you you get a tremendous amount of insight from how imperialists think when Mm -hmm. you read their books so yeah i mean i i i try to read all kinds of stuff that i disagree with yeah i mean i've just been reading things about um not reading terrorist manifestos because they're not insights they're just what they want us to think you know as opposed to some diary or something but I've always been more partial to to looking at stuff, maybe because if anything, ter- any terrible ideas were going to grab me, I don't think, you know, I don't know. I've looked at some terrible things on the Internet, some terrible ideas, and uh, they read as terrible to me. So, but. Yeah, well, you know, like I said, I mean, translating it into our politics is the key. You know, you read these things and then you apply them to your understanding of what's going on in the world. That's 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 what we're supposed to be doing. That's the job of the left. You know, the job. I mean. That's it. I mean, that's what we got to do. That's what the left did during the Vietnam War. I mean, the left was the place where that analysis came from. The yeah. liberals couldn't get it. The right yeah. wing couldn't get it. It was the leftists who had the correct analysis on Vietnam, on the nature of the Cold War, on all of those things. And, you know, that is what we are. That is our historical task. And as somebody who is living through this period, I see the events going on now as my job to provide the analysis to the best extent that to the extent that I can to provide that kind of analysis and to help people to see the world in that way. OK, full on last question. And if you can't think of it right now, you could tell me later. But do you have three books Maybe if I want to understand your politics or just go on the road to good ideas, like do you have three books for me to read? Especially if I am the lay person, so maybe not. <laughs> um, yes, uh, three books. Hmm. Good one. Um, I would say, uh, I mean, the Communist Manifesto is just so key just because it just lays out the basics, you know? So I would mm-hmm. say, I would say Marx and Engels communist manifesto, probably I would say, um, Lenin's imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, probably. Um, and, uh, the third one, uh, probably, well, if I'm thinking about the ones that were most influential for me in my thinking and in shaping how I, how my politics evolved, I would say the third one would probably have to be, uh, Franz Fanon, Wretched of the Earth. Um, I'm not but, sure I know what that is at all. Fran, Franz Fanon was the, uh, was the, um, 
Uh, he was a psychiatrist and a doctor who ultimately became one of the leading figures in the Algerian revolution, the war oh, okay. against the French colonial occup- you know, occupation of, of Algeria. I don't know enough about that at all. Uh, that... So Franz Fanon is, Franz Fanon is a, a, a key theorist in what we now call anti-colonial discourse. He's probably mm-hmm. the first of the anti-colonial thinkers. Um, and his great contribution, which you are definitely not going to like, at least on the, uh, on, on its, on its surface one of his uh important contributions he was a psychologist so he worked with uh he worked with patients in algeria who were black uh who uh and and arab who were uh for various reasons um you know committed uh Mm -hmm. for you know and and one of the things that he discovered through his many interviews and dealing with all of these different patients, one of the things he he discovered, I guess, his great sort of contribution was the psychological impact of colonialism. And he ultimately uh, was the one who kind of formulated the idea of uh, of uh, violence, revolutionary violence or anti-colonial violence as a purification for the colonial person. Right. So mm, the idea that yeah. the, the idea of, of fighting against your occupiers, against your colonial masters as a way of liberating yourself mentally from the from the constraints. Now, as I said, you are not going to like that when you hear that on its surface, but you should yeah. really do yourself a favor and read Franz Fanon, read Wretched of the Earth. It is one of the classic texts of the anti-colonial period. Uh, Fanon was the probably single most important uh, influence for the Black Panther movement in this country. He okay. was the, he was by far the most important thinker of the uh, uh, of the Black diaspora. Him along with Aimé Césaire, they were probably the two who were the most important. And uh, wretched. Uh, well, here I mean, there's several. I mean, this is. I don't know why I don't have it right there, but a dying colonialism is one of his great okay. great books. Uh, toward the African Revolution is another one of his great, you know, great collections. Um, so, I mean, there's there's many, but Wretched of the Earth is his most famous work, and I would I would probably recommend that one or Black Skin White Mask, which is his, his other famous uh, contribution. Anyway, Fanon uh, really was uh, formative for me uh, because I was uh, taking college courses with a um, an exile from Nigeria who uh, turned me on to a lot of the uh, radical politics that I got into. And Fanon was like the central figure for him and really for all revolutionary Africans. I mean, across the board sure. to a large extent, you know, among several. But yeah, I would say Wretched of the Earth, Communist Manifesto and uh, uh, State and Revolution or Imperialism, the high stage of capitalism. Those would probably be the three uh, that you would get a tremendous amount out of. And none of them are over 300 pages. So, okay. Yeah, I mean, I've always I've, I got to crack open that communist manifesto, see what Marx says more directly. Um, I never thought about reading Lenin directly. And honestly, I don't know that I knew that title, but it's a, certainly a more intriguing one to me than, you know, some of them. Well, might be because- imperialism is the one that is the analysis of, the, of, of imperialism and how it works and how it mm-hmm. relates to capitalism. State and Revolution is more uh, uh, the book about how how do you actually do the revolution, mm-hmm. you know, okay. and, and how do you build the state, you know, so um, they're, they're, they're equally important, but for different reasons, you know, so depending on what it is that you want to get out of it, imperialism has a lot more numbers, a lot more tables and data and things like that. Um, But it is, well, I I mean, I've talked about it enough, you'll get a tremendous amount out of it. And uh, it will help you to understand a lot of issues that you might not have fully appreciated the complexities of before. Hmm. Okay. Um, there's a, that was a lot of really interesting things. And I guess, I guess we can, we can let you go now. Um, tell, tell the good people where they can find you on the internet or any final thoughts, you know? Oh, sure. Thank you for having me. I, um, I didn't realize I was coming on here to be like the hype man for Lennon, but like, that's how it turned (laughs) out. Um, That's our tagline. (laughs) Yeah, apparently, I guess, you know, um, yeah, you can, you can, uh, well, of course, Counterpunch is where, um, a lot of my stuff goes. Um, I have regular, um, 
Well, I do the Counterpunch Radio as my podcast, so my podcast is always there. You can find that wherever you get your podcasts. Um, I have uh, videos that go up there as well. But if you want to find all of my stuff, you can go to Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Eric Kreitzer, E-R-I-C. D-R-A-I-T-S-E-R. Uh, all, all my stuff is there. A lot of it is free. Some of it is behind the paywall. You all know how that shit works. So, you know. All right. Oh, and, uh, oh, and, and Twitter, at Stop Imperialism on Twitter. And Facebook. and uh, Twitter and Facebook is really it. Follow the man on Twitter, please. And you can also follow the non-Servium, well, our whole deal, um, at non-Servium Media, all one word, on Twitter. Um, if you wanted to, you could follow me on Twitter. Uh, L-U-C-Y-S-T-A-G but I was mostly here to just listen to Eric um, talk a lot about stuff that I don't know enough about um, and I hope that you listeners learn some stuff too and we will see you next time listening to the non-servium podcast if you enjoyed this episode why not subscribe over on our youtube channel or on your favorite podcast platform you can also follow us across social media on twitter facebook instagram and mastodon if you're extra interested in seeing this project continue consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com but if you can't contribute financially we still like you a whole lot and you can help us out just by liking and sharing this episode or any other one that catches your fancy as always, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project alive. Thanks so much.